Hi everyone, um, good evening. Welcome to our second episode of They Call Me Coach. Um, this is uh, a live stream, so everything that goes right and goes wrong, we just deal with it as it happens. Um, this evening we're talking to Kurt, Coach Curtis Xavier, who's currently based in Birmingham. Hi Coach. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Hi Chris, good to see you. And you, and you. So look, basically um, the idea behind the show is that these are the conversations um, that coaches often want to have, but whether it's because of time or whether it's because we just lost by 40 or, you know, whether it's because of location, we, we tend not to have these conversations. So the idea behind um, behind the live stream is basically to hook up with coaches that, that I know, that I've that I've met in the past, that I that I coach against during the season, and and hopefully over time we'll be able to reach out to some different coaches, not just here in the UK, but all across the kind of coaching kind of um, landscape. So um, this week we're talking to Coach X. Some of you may be aware of of kind of your your um, history and your your. Um, your kind of movement in the game, but just for those people who maybe aren't aware of kind of what you've done or what you're doing right now, can you give me a, a shortish um, kind of summary of, can we start with your playing career? Like, how did you get involved in the game of basketball? Okay, so a Nottingham School, St. Bernadette's, completely nuts on basketball. Okay, so you walk through the door at what's now year seven, and that's the first sport you're going to get into. And at that time in Nottingham, every secondary school, I mean, every secondary school had a basketball team at every single year through the school. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something obscure. You were going to play basketball as well as football. They were the two things you did. Very successful school teams, you know, regionally, nationally, played in all the competitions. And looks like everybody else at that time, you went from your school side to your, what was then city boys. So to make a county side, you had to make a regional city team and then a city team, and then a regional county team to make the county team. So a lot different than it is now. From there, you did the typical thing. You went on to um, play National League juniors. Um, I came to National League very late, um, sort of 14, 15 years old, really, for Nottingham. Um, made the England under-15 team, 17s, 19s, all the way through to the senior men with Dave Titmus would have been my coach had I not retired. Played National League, won National League with Nottingham, with Gateshead. Um, let's see. From Nottingham to Liverpool, BBL at 18, 17, 18. So really, from there, I played professionally until I was 26, nearly 27, retired early. Um, but my career took me all across the world as a, as a player, as you can imagine, playing internationally. But this, probably the single biggest influence was spending summers in New York with a, a guy called Michael Pyatt who was then at Liverpool, went on to play from Birmingham, and one of the Hall of Famers, really, if you go back. So those influences were very strong and spent much of my time in the States in the summertime, just soaping up the culture. Coming back then from playing with Gary Cat Johnson at Calderdale, which had been my best years at Calderdale in West Yorkshire, and then from there, straight into coaching, which I was always going to do. Um, so my playing career was kind of short, because I cut it short at 27, but I had a really good time, really competitive time in, in the game at, at that time. And, you know, was more than happy to call it a day when I did. OK, so you talk about um, you, you, you talk about it being such a, a kind of sure thing that you were going to go into coaching. Give give me mm. start to give me some dates um, as, in terms of when did you make that move from playing into coaching and, and where did that coaching journey start? Oh, it starts back at school. At my school, I had to, by the time I was 15 years old, I was responsible for working with the year eights. I had no choice. David Burgess is like, right, in the gym, you were working with younger people. Um, if you were an older guy in our school, your responsibility is to pass it down, and that's what I did. I, I took it from him. Um, uh, the, the idea of, of just being in that position where you could help somebody else and help develop was very, very early. Very, very early. So by the time I was 16, I'd coached my sister's team in the local league ladies team. Um, you know, coached the... the and so it started very, very early, Chris. I'd worked camps all my life. I did the national schools camp as a player. So I did Lee Green, which was at that time, 
the national schools camp at 19, I'm going to say I was one of the coaches on the England under 16 regional camp. So I'd always taught for me, the coaching came after the teaching. So I'd always want to be in the gym, showing somebody how to improve X, Y, or Z. And then I spent the summers in the States again. So I worked all the top camps from Morgan Woodens to Matha High School to Villanova's, Raleigh Massimino's to Five Star to you name it, Dr. J's camp. I'd done all those camps while I was playing. So I would not just go to the States and practice and work, but I, I literally would spend summers coaching. And probably the second biggest influence on that outside of David Birds was a guy called Tom Galizzi, who was at LIU in New York, Long Island University at the time. I ran into him in, uh, as a 19 year old in New York, in, sorry, in Hungary. I actually played it for Chris, can you remember uh, Laszlo Nemeth? Yeah. I played against Laszlo in Hungary. I reminded him You that played against him as a player? Playing. Yeah, one, yeah, one wow. of the teams that he played for. I was, I was guesting with an Irish team as a ringer for an Irish team from Cork and we went on tour. And that's where I met Tom. He recruited me to go to college, but I, did, I wasn't one for sitting in the classroom. I wanted to play, so I stayed and turned pro and stayed in the pros. But then I spent just about as many summers either in Harlem or up on Long Island at his university, just following around, listening to what he would do, how he would prepare the season, how he taught. So from 19, 20 years old, I was in that environment. You know, I was around those coaches. You know, I went to clinics with some of the greats in American colleges. And so the career it was always a case I was going to, I was going to coach in some way, shape or form. Cause I did it all the way through my playing career. I ran camps, I ran clinics. I did lessons every week. So I'd run all, no matter where I played, I'd be the person that did the youth development as they call it. Uh, to me, it was just coaching. I would do that two, three sessions a night. Anybody from 11 to 18, come play, learn your skills. That was always me. I was the guy that was in the gym. Okay. So. You mentioned camps and, you know, running camps. I mean, uh, for anybody who, who doesn't know, that's actually where we, we first met at Bradford University. I was, I was a really young coach. I'd been coaching maybe about two or three seasons. Um, we met in the sports centre and I don't know, we, <laughs> just had this, we just had this connection and we got talking and you invited me to one of your run press run camps in Loughborough. Ooh. And I was, Ooh. Uh, I remember thinking that I was really out of my depth. Like I was going to come to this camp, but I didn't really know whether I could hang with the other coaches. And, but boy, those experiences, they, they made me as a coach. Like I learned, you know, I, obviously I went there to coach kids, but I learned so much um, about coaching, about managing people, um, and I laughed more than I've ever laughed before in my entire life. Like, you know, some of the guys that I met on those camps, um, like I remember we would get the kids to bed and if we weren't on duty that night, you know, we would, you know, you'd order some pizzas and, you know, we'd, we'd just hang out and we would probably be up till, um, we'd probably be up to like late, late hours in the morning, just talking and, yeah. and laughing. I learned so much on those experiences. What, what, um, That's camp culture. what that drove you to run those camps? As a player, like I said, I'd been in the States. So I did, I've done everything from Dr. J's camp to Syracuse camp. i have done them all. And I, I looked at the way that the Americans used the summer to get players better. You know, in the season, it's all about winning and losing. But most of the development was done at camps in the summertime. Obviously, they have like a three-month summer, you know, because those are six weeks. But it was very much part of the culture that is, if you were a young teenager, you went to camp. And I saw stations and how they broke the skills down and how they taught them. And it was just one of those things that said to me, mm, not only could I learn to teach myself, but also it was a great side hustle. Because remember, as a player back then, you did okay. And I've got to be fair, in my, early, in my years in the Northeast, I was really well looked after. But there was nothing, no provision in the holidays for young players to learn and play. So two and two, you know, like side hustle. Both, not only did I enjoy it in the interaction, but I could make a good living from it. It really supplemented your income unbelievably well. October, everything about all the half terms that you had and the summer, 
And basically nobody was doing anything. And so when I took the American experience and I thought, well, I'll try it in England and it worked. It worked. Yeah, of course the kids want to come and play. Set up stations, skills, play, rewards, like you say, pizza, trophies, you name it. Mom and dad just dropped them off. You're in charge, you know. And even in the early days, I, I still can remember starting camps with like eight kids and not caring. It was the best three days ever. We played three on three and two on two and one on one. And before you know it, it's 24 kids. So really, really the big thing for me, and I'll, I'll never forget this, is when I was in Halifax, I was playing for Calderdale. And one of the local guys had a cafeteria. I knew him well, I was always eating there. I said, listen, I'm gonna run a camp, would you sponsor it? He said, what do you want me to do? I said, buy the t-shirts. And he said, yeah. And he said, as long as the kids buy the food. So we set up the food and then the local authority gave me, because I played for the team, they gave me the court for nothing. So I, was, I hustled the court for nothing, which means I could give the kids the court cheaper. Then I paid all of my older players, my older youth team players, 18, 90s, they came and they were my coaches because obviously I was teaching them and all they had to do was teach the same thing to the kids in stations. And that was it. I was, that was it then. You know, I'm like, yeah, got to do camps, got to do camps, got to do clinics. And basically that's what made me do it. The love of teaching. I could see my own players getting better. But really, it was also the camaraderie you get between working with the coaches and also you learn a lot when you're teaching because you realize what I was doing as a player wasn't quite right because I was teaching some of the things that I wasn't doing as a pro. And I'll be honest with you, that was, that was, I was like, wow, I don't do that. <laughs> and that's how I got into it. And, and it stuck. It absolutely stuck. Well, look, just amazing experiences. I just wanted to say um, a, a thank you to you for for letting me get involved and they were some amazing years funnily enough when i was doing um some of the publicity for this week's show um one of the kids that i remember i don't know if you remember a girl called emma pass of course yeah emma was emma was a camp all-star she never missed she was she was emma crazy was like my, emma was like my prodigy i mean it was, chris you know what's funny emma was it was, this is how emma was farmer's girl emma's a probably country girl and she was one of those athletes that just kept going and kept going and she would come to camp for a week and i knew she wanted to do a second week but necessarily couldn't afford it so i used to say to her look why don't you work a week as a counselor for next to nothing you can play every night and you can come on the next week for free and for i'm i'm going to say chris she did every single camp that i had at run press run she never missed. She had every single T-shirt. And you know how valuable those T-shirts are. I do, I do. I do. Lynn's still <laughs> she's got, got one of those everyone... T-shirts. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, she still got, she had them all. She was one of the all-stars. She came to every single camp every year. So she, yeah, well, Emma's well, like. Fun, hey, well, hey, well, the, 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 beauty of, the, the beauty of that experience is that, you know, just even a couple of days, she actually sent me a message saying, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm going to see Coach X. So, um, <laughs> Emma, I love you to death, wherever you are in the world, mate. Just so appreciate you. She's always going to be an all-star for us. Well, I think she's in, um, she's in Perth, Australia right now, I think, working. She said, I, I don't know, I don't want to get this wrong. I think she's retired um, after, right. you know, a few uh, some good years traveling. Um, I think in a message she said to me she'd got bored of um, living out of a suitcase, but on the yeah, flip side, yeah. she's been all over the world as a result of basketball. So, um, yeah, yeah, and, big and, shout and, out. And, to yeah, nobody more deserving, Chris. Nobody absolutely committed in every way. Got a, so much time for him to pass. Yeah. So, um, you know, moving on from camps, I mean, uh, recently, so I, I think we bumped into each other. Like I, I tend to see you like every kind of five or ten years, and I'm like, how have yeah. we not spoken more between that time? But right. we're fortunate enough to kind of touch base kind of last summer, and um, I, I realised but at that time that you'd you'd kind of been in the game, so you, you know you talk about kind of coaching, and I know you coached, you know some some uh, pro level basketball, and I remember you you did a stint at Loughborough for a couple of years or maybe it was longer than that, then you were in Nottingham. And then it felt like you kind of, 
disappeared off the face of the earth for a little while. And then the last time I saw you, you, you started telling me about what you were starting to build at Aston Manor. So could you tell me a little bit about, did you have a hiatus? Did you fall off the edge of the earth for a while? What brought you back to coaching? Well, a bit of everything, Chris. Um, being my, my personality is I'm an all or nothing type type of coach teacher. I, I, I assume that everybody wants to be back. You know, everybody wants to be absolutely at the races. You know, that I just assume that. And in my naivete, that's not the case. So, again, traveling Wilbury is what I've been. And anywhere I would go, anybody said, listen, come and do a session here. I've, I'm one of those that will find myself there just because I want to be on the floor working out kids and working out anybody that will come. So, over the years, there's been a couple of gaps. There was a gap um, before I went to Loughborough. Um, and then, obviously, the Loughborough University days, I coached at Bolton and Berry. I coached at, you just name it, many National League teams. We won championships at Doncaster. As you know, um, we had the situation where I came back to Nottingham. That didn't work out. And then I spent a lot of years just literally just working out individuals. You know, so if there was a guy, I mean, I, I spent some time in the summers. I, if there was a guy in, in, in a gym somewhere and wanted to work out and work on his game, I'd do that. I mean, I was at Nottingham Trent for two, three years. I didn't play, not coaching. I'm in the team, but just use it as a base to work people out that wanted to get better. And I coached at Mansfield for a year. But what I realized is that, and it was really strange because in those hiatus years, you realize you had time to think, look, exactly where it is that I want to be teaching or coaching. And I realized there are very few opportunities to teach. You, you don't really get much chance to teach at the National League men or women or even the National League juniors. Just, you know, two nights a week, six balls and 10 guys. You, there's no teaching or very little. You know, you, you, you do, you do, you're teaching by walking around. I admire those people because that's more coaching, preparing to win. And I realized what I really wanted to do is prepare the athlete to get better, to be good enough to be able to win. In other words, teach. So I, I, I went off to South Nottingham College. I spent some years there. I had great years there. I had some really good successes with Nottingham kids, kids from all over. Um, and that's where I sort of spent the time to think, well, the next time I coach, I'd want to coach in an environment where fundamentally I had control of the environment and the intangibles. That doesn't happen in the UK. Okay. So I got, I took time out. And again, I was another couple of years after Mansfield, and it was just by chance, Doggy, Paul Douglas was in Birmingham, we were in touch with each other, and we'd worked together at South Knots, South Knots, and he said, do you want to come over and do some work with me? And it was, again, working at club stuff, just, you know, fun stuff, and it was me, but it wasn't me, but I enjoyed the experience to get back on the floor again, but it just so happened that one day, Doug got a call from Dave Brown, an old Solent, you know, Dave Brown, of, I mean, those of you in Southampton will know Dave Brown from yesteryear. And Dave is a Birmingham man. And he, he said that there was an opportunity that the head teacher wanted to have academies at the sixth form. So after another two year hiatus, what I basically did, I took a year out again. I stayed so three years in total. And I, and I, I joined on board with Doug and it, there you go. But it took me that long to realize that what I really was, was so much a better teacher than coach. And so, therefore, I didn't take coaching jobs or all those things because I wasn't suited. And I knew that, but it took me a long time to, to get to that point. Okay, so you're at, you're at Aston Manor now. And, you know, it's, it's, called, it's referred to as Aston Manor Basketball Academy. You know, it's part of the, it's part of the, the kind of school mm -hmm. program. Or, or it's mm -hmm. an option for those who, who want mm -hmm. to genuinely improve. And you can tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about... Mm -hmm what it takes to be involved in that academy. But, you know, when I look at academies now um, across the UK, you know, if there's a, a young kid, you know, 14, 15, and they're, they're thinking that they want to get involved, they want to seriously, they want to take their basketball seriously, they want to make that next kind of jump um, in terms of their development. And they see all these academies around the country. But unfortunately in the UK, there's no real consistency with those academies. Like pretty much anybody can call themselves an academy. So at your academy, tell me if you can describe to me what makes 
Aston Manor Academy an academy in your in your idea in your in your mind? Well, I I, I like you, coach. I, I don't overused. It's lost all sense of meeting meaning. So to me, Aston Aston Manor basketball is basically a high school team. Okay, the thing for me, the the standards, everything to me is the standards that we set internally. So we don't mirror ourselves against anybody in the world, period. It's what do we want to get done? Setting the school aside, because it's a high it's a high performing school. I've been absolutely fortunate enough to have this, the staff members at the school, and particularly the head teacher, Jill Sweeney, with tremendous support for performance. And by that I mean the highest possible standards all of the time. And not in terms of results, but the whole outcome, our approach to teaching, discipline, execution, personal development, those things to me set you aside. So sometimes winning doesn't really tell the truth. You know, we've had boys already in the short time that I've been there, go to the States, turn pro, get university education, otherwise they may not have gotten them. You know, so for me, it's the all encompassing thing that let's just use one word, two words, standards and execution. If you set the highest possible standards, all we have to do is create an environment where those where success is inevitable, measured by getting the most out of each athlete. So first of all, we're not team oriented. My priority is the individual and the skill and personal development of that athlete. So we, we, you know, the winning is a byproduct. You know, we, we, we treat it somewhat differently. The individual, particularly at this level, we find in boys that still have not mastered any one single fundamental. They can run, they can jump, they, you know, wow, they can sweat. But as I've always said, sweat doesn't merely mean anything. It just means that, you know, you're overworking. What we try and do is get them to understand themselves and first and foremost, I'm not interested in team, that comes second. My team is made up of individuals. And if my individuals are talented and disciplined enough, then our team will take care of itself. So unlike most, Chris, I don't put team first. As an ex-player, I had very little skill development instruction. And I, yet I got all that way. I just often wonder how would I have been if somebody had taught me to master those skills, not at 21, but at 15. And that's how I separate what we do from most anything else in terms of academy. I've modeled it on dance, as I said to you before, on martial arts, on table tennis, on tennis. The individual, for me, is the starting point of any change in culture. The unit is in direct proportion to the quality of the people that play in it, not the other way around. To me, my biggest weakness is when I put team first and I, I no longer accept that. That's, that's just bad form to me. As an academy, as you would say, as youth development, later on down the line, their coaches like you, if you're your National League men's coach, they've got to go and do it themselves. But really, they should have already acquired those skills. Yeah. We're a teaching school. We're very much geared towards mastery of the basics, boring as hell, we don't do tricks. I don't. I don't. I don't know how to do it myself. So I couldn't. I forget me at YouTube. I'm still teaching. Chris, I've told you before. Go right and finish. Go left and finish. Make a jump shot. Keep some. Keep the ball in front of you. From a team perspective, pass the ball to somebody in the same color shirt as you. <laughs> and, yeah. and I and I and I and in Birmingham with the 1.3 million people. We have not succeeded in that city at, at doing that. And my, I really want to turn what the young boys in Birmingham and the West Midlands, because we get them from across the West Midlands, they really come in from day one and it's how you tie your shoelaces, it's right-handed layups, left-handed layups, chest passes. So I'm really proud of that as well. I'm really proud because if one boy comes to you or girls come to you, I want to know that you're going to say, you know what, that's one of the boys at Aston or one of the girls at Aston, they're prepared. Well, look, I mean, one of the things that, um, I mean, again, I came, I was fortunate enough to come and actually watch you guys work work out over the Christmas period. So while other people were getting fat over Turkey, your your boys were in there working out, yep. you know, full full days, doing a three-day three stint. And 
um, you know, one of the things I remember us discussing was not really just about, you know, you talked about what are the building blocks for developing fundamentals in our kids. Um, you know, we talked about footwork, the ability to shoot the ball, the ability to pass right and left, the ability to understand the game and make decisions under pressure at, at kind of game speed. Um, th these these are fundamentals. I, I don't, you know, I find it quite difficult to to um, to kind of mess with, you know, those. It's not it's not any more complex than that. I think some people try and make something that is actually pretty simple or complicated than it needs to be. Um, yeah. And 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 I and I've been guilty of doing that myself in the past. Um, but what I think the other thing that we talked about was actually some of the values that you're instilling in those kids if they want to be successful sometimes some of those kids first have to learn how to get out of their own way and i remember i was just it was just happenstance that on the day that i came there was a kid and you you told me a bit of a story that he was a really good kid he'd been in other programs he was a you know potentially he could be a good athlete a good player but unfortunately he didn't know how to get out of his own way and i think at that point, I don't want to call him out, but I think his brother brought him down and, you know, you had to have a conversation about, do you want to be in this program? Do you, can you get out of your own way so that I can help you? And, you know, I think what sometimes we overlook that we're not just teaching basketball, but we're teaching people the life skills that they're going to need outside of the game of basketball. Chris, it's everything. Forget the, what you do with the ball. If you, if you just, if it's a person, you're just wrong. How does that work when you're playing a sport where everything becomes ultimately about cooperation, self-discipline, self-awareness? I've said, we had that discussion. We don't deal with self-awareness very well. I know I didn't. You know, I got to 30 before I even thought about the word. What, what is that? Well, to me, I am not leaving it with my boys till they hit the 30. They're going to figure out who they are real quick at any given time. They're going to learn to appreciate themselves. So, you know, so things like punctuality, being on time, being so disciplined, is taking care of their own needs, not mine. So if I can help them understand that these are all skills that they need for their benefit, then they're in a situation where they can pick up the ball already with those essential human qualities that allows them to be able to say, okay, I can do this with the basketball. But it, it, you, can't, you can't remove one from the other. I mean, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not so much role modeling it. I'm just trying to make reality happen. You have to be able to decide very quickly what you want out of this. I'm not making those decisions. But once you make a decision, you then have to take the necessary steps to make it happen. How do we do that? And it's very, very simple rules. Get over yourself is one of them. Realize the world, although you are a very important part of it, when you come to basketball, there are other people that rely on you. You know, if you miss a class and, 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 and you can't get to basketball because your grades are not good enough, your teammates suffer. Not, not just you, but your teammates. You know, we've lost games that we saw before because we've got three or four kids who've not made the grade at school, so now the team suffers. And I think in any walk of life, what you're doing is creating teams and it doesn't matter. So we use those terminologies like we say all the time. One of the big things I ask for them, are you your brother's keeper? And they'll say no. Mm. But you want to play a team game. You want the school to, you know, we say to them, we say to them their biggest partner is their school. Because of the school, they get free time. They don't have to pay to go to prep school. They don't have to find seven grand to go to an ABL team. They get to practice. They've got a free weights room, free travel. They don't have to pay subs to a National League club. Please understand that. The yeah. second biggest part, you, 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 know, you know what I mean, Chris? There's a dollar sign to that. There's a pound sign. Also, how, they, how they, they, they are with their parents. The sneakers you've got on your feet. The clothes that you're wearing. The meals that you eat. And they're not even aware of that. They just think, oh, that's the way the world works. We, we soon get rid of that real quick. Yeah. <laughs> real well, look, quick. Um, we're, we're, about to, um, we're about to finish off. But before we go, I wanted to ask you about 
I, I, I did text you earlier on today just to check whether or not you'd managed to catch um, the, the first two episodes of The Last Dance. And, yes. um, you know, and, you know, being, you know, that was literally for me, um, 1997 was actually the time when I decided I was going to take basketball seriously. By then I'd been in the game for about five years. So I came to basketball very, very late. Um, but I'd had five years of watching the Bulls and watching their kind of, you know, growing up with their domination of the sport. I actually just assumed that's how the game was played by everyone. Um, but clearly, you know, they set themselves apart. Um, and watching those two episodes, I managed to watch it this morning while I was looking after my kids. Um, yeah, it really kind of, I don't think, for me, there weren't any great surprises. But tell me, you know, how did... First and foremost, you know, was Michael Jordan uh, somebody that you followed, that you kind of watched? You know, what was the the, the Chicago Bulls an organization that you watched with any sense of reverence during that time? Yeah, it, it, the Bulls, Jordan, my, my relationship with Jordan started when he was a freshman in college. That Georgetown game, the way he hit that when he hit the shot, shot. I, was, yeah. I was a Hoya fan. But to be honest with you, Chris, Chris, the first college team I'd ever seen was in England, was North Carolina. They came to England in the late 70s, and they used to play in a tournament at the Phillips. Right. So if you can believe North Carolina came to Crystal Palace and played in a tournament live. So I had an affinity with, with the Tar Heels. So when I watched them play, they were like my, at that time, my two favorite college teams, the Georgetown Hoyers and North Carolina Tar Heels. Jordan at that time, when he hit that shot, it did change a lot, but I didn't really follow Jordan till at all because I was a Magic Johnson and Larry Bird era. Okay, that was really the heart of my time. When Michael came along, it was towards the middle, towards the end of my career. But what what was more what was more amazing about the organization it wasn't so much the organization; is how we dragged the game forward. The, the ultra competitor. People are not as competitive as Michael. What got me was you could just see his disdain for anything that wasn't all out. That wasn't and that's what winning. I remember most. That's what I remember most about him and the Bulls, that he forced this, he willed his teammate, forced his teammate, did whatever it took, but he was not having them let up. Because you've got to remember, it was eight years before Michael Jordan won anything. He didn't come in as, you know, he's a great college player and all that. But the Chicago Bulls, they weren't winning anything. Mm. What he, he, eight years it took him, and it's his testimony to his discipline and his hard work. But what he did, Chris, and what, without any doubt, he just changed the global view of the game. Nobody can say that. And that's what, that was what I was like, wow. Here's a young black man from Wilmington, North Carolina, in the middle of nowhere. He wasn't a New York City kid. He wasn't an L.A. kid. He was a country person who just globally dragged the sport and the culture into the, into the next century. And I don't think you can never, ever underestimate what he did in terms of that cultural change. It really brought about to the forefront that not only did he do an athlete, but as a young black male man, that you can transcend your, where you come from. You can transcend race, color, creed. It didn't matter. He did that single-handedly. Well, look, if you at any most point, about. if at any point you're being um, talked about as more famous than the Pope, you've clearly, yeah. you've done something wrong, yeah. right? You've done yeah. something right. Yeah, no, he was, he was, he was the most famous person in the world at one time. I don't, I don't care who you are. You, everybody knew Michael Jordan. Brilliant. Outstanding. Amazing, amazing. Well, look. No, go, go on, ahead, go on. No, well, look, so, I, before, I know, um... so the basketball aside, MJ and the Bulls were cultural icons just because of the way they played also. And a shout out to the coach who will never get the credit he deserves to have players like Michael and that stature and be able to find ways to engage him in the team. Phil Jackson takes an awful lot of credit, an awful lot of credit. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much for joining me this evening. This, this won't be the last time that I ask you to come, to come on and share and share. Chris, the, when you are, um, anytime.
Anytime, it's a pleasure, mate. You I know love, that. Look, be in touch soon. I, I love talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, You're and welcome. We will be Appreciate in touch it, soon. matey. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night.